Good day, everybody. I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar titled Disaggregating Death, George Floyd and the Significance of Black Male Mortality and Police Encounters. My name is Justin Greenidge, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction at the University of Minnesota. I will be serving as the host and moderator for this event. Uh, before I introduce Dr. Curry, I'd like to say some brief announcements. First, this event is spot sponsored by Grad Said, the College of Education's graduate student organization. So many thanks to them for organizing this event. Also during Dr. Curry's talk, please feel free to submit questions via the Q&A tab on the toolbar. Uh, we should have time toward the end of the webinar for, for a Q&A session. If you are going to be using uh, ASL interpreters, please feel free to pin their video. And then lastly, this event uh, will, be, will be recorded. Um, finally, I, I do wanna acknowledge uh, the current moment we are in with the tragedy that took place in Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, as well as other recent tragedies. Speaking personally as someone who grew up in the Twin Cities, currently lives in nearby Brooklyn Park and has taught high school previously for over a decade in the area, uh, how much pain, sadness, stress I feel, the community feels, we all feel. Um, how, however, in the midst of this suffering, my hope is that we all redouble our efforts to establish and build coalitions take care of each other and continue to, to engage in the fight for racial justice. I urge for this moment to be a call for critical reflection and a call for strategic actions to commit to wherever you are right now and whatever community you are a part of to resist racism and white supremacy from all recognizable angles, both large and small and in whatever way possible. With this struggle in mind, I'm very excited to be here with you uh, for this timely, important, and urgent talk. Now, now to introduce Dr. Curry. Tommy J. Curry is a professor of philosophy and holds the personal chair of Africana Phil Philosophy and Black Male Studies at the University of Edinburgh. His research interests are 19th century ethnology, critical race theory, intraracial violence and black male studies. He is the author of The Man Not, Race, Class, Genre and the Dilemmas of Black Manhood, which won an American Book Award in 2018. And Another White Man's Burden, Josiah Royce's Quest for a Philosophy of Racial Empire, which recently won the Josiah Royce Prize for American Idealist Thought. He has also republished the forgotten philosophical works of William Ferris as the philosophical treatise of William H. Ferris, selected readings from the African abroad or his evolution in Western civilization. In 2019, he became the editor of the first book series dedicated to the study of black males entitled Black Male Studies, a series exploring the paradoxes of racially subjugated males on Temple University Press. Dr. Curry's research has been recognized by diverse as placing him among the top 15 emerging scholars in the United States in 2018. And his public intellectual work earned him the Society for the Advancement of American Philosophy's Elaine Locke Award in 2017. He is the past president of the Philosophy Born of Struggle, one of the oldest black philosophy organizations in the United States. Welcome, Dr. Curry. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. <clears throat> uh, I want to begin by, by acknowledging that we're living in the midst of a crisis, um, one that we see very publicly, um, but nonetheless, one that we seem to be unable to grasp intellectually. Uh, this paper, <clears throat> Disaggregating Death, George Floyd and the Significance of Black Male Mortality and Police Encounters, uh, tries to push us beyond the limitation of theory and ideology uh, to recognize the lethality and, and the brutal 
uh, forces, just the, the sheer violence that, that black men are subject, subjected to in the United States. Oh, the execution of George Perry Floyd, his public lynching, has been broadcast all over the world. Eight minutes and 46 seconds has become synonymous with black male death. 846 now represents an epoch of death or the period in which black life expires and death occurs. In eight minutes and 46 seconds, Mr. Floyd, his living flesh was turned into rotting meat. His body was transformed into a corpse. Derek Chauvin killed Mr. Floyd in broad daylight on a street in Minneapolis, Minnesota on May 25th, 2020. Chauvin deliberately murdered Mr. Floyd. He was unmoved by the demands of the public to take his knee off of the neck of Mr. Floyd and show little remorse or regard towards Mr. Floyd after his actions led to Mr. Floyd's death. The Minneapolis police chief described Chauvin's killing of Mr. Floyd as murder. There's a culture of permissibility that allowed the other attending officers to remain unmoved by the fixation and subsequent death of Mr. Floyd. Today, we see the murder of another black man, Mr. Wright. Now, if we listen to the liberal academy, if we listen to the call for coalitions and reflection, we have nothing more than the deaths of black men, dead black male bodies, their corpses, uh, to hope, uh, and we hope that that inspires change. No words, our philosophical reflection can accurately describe the ferarity or the most lethal violence generated to enforce the kind of dehumanization behind the acts that killed Mr. Floyd and Mr. Wright. It is not only white racism, but the societal level stigmatization of black males that permits this repetition of death. And I wanna highlight here that we're not talking about racism as some generic form of anti-blackness. I'm not interested in the idea that it's the hatred of black people that motivates white cops, be they male or female, to kill these young black men. I'm interested particularly at the kind of violence, the, that misandric violence that leads to the death of young black men and boys. So the lethal violence and oppression black males suffer in the United States differ by orders of magnitude from that of their female counterparts and other whites. America is a slaughterhouse for black men and boys and attempts through violence to remove them from American society. This unbridled assault upon the black male is enacted by the most grotesque displays of torture and torment. The public exhibitions of power enacted amongst bl um, um, upon black male bodies inspire wonderment and awe among anticipating American audiences. Their spilled blood, their last breaths, the videos of black males urinating on themselves and calling for their mothers, the murmurs of desperation heard only as the last yells of, I can't breathe, fascinate American observers who yearn for that moment where the black male dies and becomes a corpse. Black males live with death on their minds. Throughout their daily lives, rituals of dehumanization are administered upon their flesh and imposed upon their souls. This violence is of a different kind than that which is often deployed in philosophical and academic prose. The black male is the cadaver of white America's sadistic delight. His flesh absorbs the racist paroxysm of the world. He is the object of the non-human experimentation. Because his death serves as an example, his brutalization takes place before the world that assaults him with physical and psychical violence, white rage and societal disregard. A world where he's trapped by the knowledge that a black boy only lives to see just how deadly the insouciance towards a black man can be. For the last several years, I have sought to understand the murder and suffering of black males in the United States. In 2014, when Michael Brown was executed in broad daylight, I suggested there was a need for a genre study of black male death and dying in the United States. 
Since then, I have argued that the systematic violence against Black males was the product of social political forces designed to have population level effects on Black men and boys in the United States. My work culminated in a field of study showing that lethal violence against Black males is so disproportionate that current race and gender theories throughout American universities were deliberately misrepresenting the conditions of Black men and boys to preserve their political illusions of democracy and maintain the coherence of their disciplinary theory and training. For better or for worse, Black male studies has demanded a re-examination of the previous research depicting black males as beneficiaries of masculinity in white patriarchal societies. Given the misandric aggression of anti-black racism, the ignored but astronomical rates of sexual violence against black males, and the demonization of black men within contemporary gender theory, I argue that the death and dying of black males called for new study. Expressing outrage as the systemic phenomena of black male death is futile. I'll say that again. That's expressing outrage, right? At the systemic phenomena of black male death is futile because the removal of black males from this society is purposive. It's not accidental. It's not an aberration of democracy, but rather a programmatic and foundational aspect to the thriving of white society and the social mobility of various groups, including other blacks. So my reaction to the death of Mr. Floyd, just as my reaction to the death of Mr. Wright, looks at the usurpation of black male death within academic theory or how the death of black men and boys is possessed by others as racism or made generic and conceptualized as a kind of violence that maligns all black bodies equal. Academic theory and political consensus allows everyone except black men and boys to claim black male death as their own. Their usurpation of black male death is conceptually numbing because it forces us to lie the evidence of a deliberate program against black males of which Mr. Floyd fell victim. This brief reflection on the murder of Mr. Floyd attempts to contextualize his murder and then theoretically explore the ramifications his death has for our thinking and resistance against white America. And I take this to be an especially important project because the way that we've consistently engaged the deaths of black men and boys in the United States has largely been through indifference. We've seen the outrage performed at their deaths on the streets. We've taken on this language and this rhetoric within disciplines. But the very people who are being exterminated and eliminated, Black men and boys, have not been the dominant speakers of their own demise. They have not been allowed to interpret how the world treats them, how the world sees them, or better yet, even have an acknowledged standpoint that perhaps they, as victims of this kind of racist or misandric violence, best understand the processes that are taking aim to exterminate them, right? So when we, what do I mean then when I say we need to disaggregate death by the police? Well, the first thing is that we have to understand the notion of a misandric aggression. Mr. Floyd's death is the product of misandric social processes that are used to discipline, debase, and in many cases eliminate black males from American society. The negative stereotypes that whites have about racial groups are more similar to their perceptions of the men from the racial ethnic groups than that of the women. Now, previous research has shown that when we're looking at stereotypes, that we're in fact talking about the dominant male group. So stereotypes of an ethnic group will be more similar to the stereotypes of the men than the women of that ethnic group. Other studies have found, right, looking at team study, for instance, that even when we're talking about the stereotypes of criminality, right, and danger that's associated with blackness, those concepts are more strongly associated with black males than they are black females. So there is a gender difference in how racism and racial stereotypes actually function. This work from McConaughey and White actually demonstrate this, that when we look at a broad group-based analysis of how whites perceive blacks or violence amongst blacks, they see that you see that they think that blacks are more violent than whites, that men are more violent than women. But we're asking, well, what does that racial category contain? What, what are they thinking about when they think about violent blacks? You see, the answer is very obvious. They think that it's black men. Black men are the most violent. Black men are the ones that are pushing the stereotype of, of black violence, 
uh, in the United States in the minds of whites. And while black women are certainly thought to be more violent than, than white women, they're certainly thought to be less violent than white men. So there's a gender aspect there that's, that's taking them out of the dominant racial stereotype. But we, even when we look at something like sexual promiscuity, we see the exact same thing. While white Americans may think that see blacks as being more sexually promiscuous than whites and men being more sexually promiscuous than women, it's really black men. It's the negative stereotypes that white Americans hold about black men that is driving the generic stereotype about blacks in general. So these stigmas against blacks um, end up building a societal consensus for their murder and removal from society, no matter how brutal the means. In racist, capitalist, patriarchal societies, the criminalization and lethal extermination of outgroup racialized males are strategies that maintain social hierarchy and promote social cohesion. This targeting and elimination of outgroup males by the dominant group due to their biological and cultural threats uh, mean that these men and boys pose uh, a, a threat to the dominant group. Uh, other theorists have referred to this as the subordinate male target hypothesis. Now, the subordinate male target hypothesis explains why Western capitalist societies tend to socially construct outgroup males as threats to dominant groups, to the dominant group, and establish a so-called uh, order or social hierarchy in a given society. Social dominance theorists argue that outgroup men are the primary targets of arbitrary set discrimination, while women of subordinate and dominant classes are primarily victims of patriarchal oppression. In other words, the patriarchal violence against women is paternalistic and coercive, not lethal and exterminatory. So the specific type of violence outgroup males disproportionately suffer is called arbitrary set discrimination for the social dominance theories. The social dominance theories would then argue that arbitrary sets are socially constructed in highly salient group-based group -based characteristics, things such as nation, religion, or, or race. So while arbitrary set groups exhibit higher levels of flexibility, arbitrariness, and plasticity compared to age and gender systems, arbitrary set systems are associated with the most extreme forms of lethal and genocidal violence in human history. Now, the purpose of such violence is to create as much distance and negative social capital between racialized male groups and the dominant racial group as possible. So this means that outgroup males will suffer more direct discrimination in the housing market, incarceration, employment, and policing the subordinate and dominant group and females in the same society. So as Jim Sedanis and Rosemary Venegas explain, quotes, the reasoning behind the expectation is that arbitrary set discrimination is primarily a form of intersexual competition perpetuated by male, perpetrated by males and directed against males. As such, arbitrary set discrimination can also be viewed as a form of low level warfare directed against outgroup males. Now, the work of Sedanius, Venegas, and Prado suggests to us that the operation of racism requires more nuance, that we're not simply talking about a generic hatred, right? As the McConaughey and, and White uh, graphs of our analysis showed, there's a component to the way that we think of anti-Black racism that's fundamentally misandric. It's tied to the ways in which we debase and dehumanize and caricaturize racialized men, specifically Black men. So that means that anti-Black racism is not driven by the generic and equal hatred of all Black people. Rather, it's specifically targeted to the stereotypes, the hatred, and the need to eliminate Black men specifically in white supremacist societies. Now, this analysis has been addressed by intersectionality theory. This pattern of discrimination has been connected or really conceded by intersectionality theorists. Uh, Valerie Perdue Vons and Richard Eibach have argued that in Western patriarchal societies, invisibility, right? Invisibility protects subordinate females from being the direct targets of oppression and lethal violence. These authors argue that subordinate males become targets of lethal violence because in patriarchal societies, men are valued over women. And this lethal targeting of subordinate males or black men within these patriarchal societies could be interpreted as a kind of androcentrism or male privilege. As Purdue Vons and Eibach explain, quote, the oppression of subordinate group men like black men is the product of psychological dispositions that evolved as males competed for resources in the human ancestral environment. By contrast, intersectional invisibility views the oppression of subordinate group men as a reflection of the general tendency in an androcentric society to view all men, both those of dominant groups and of subordinate groups, as more important than women. 
It is this marginalization of women in an androcentric society that causes subordinate women to be relatively ignored as direct targets of oppression compared to subordinate men. Now, the patterns of violence within racist, capitalist, and patriarchal societies have remained stable throughout the 20th century and mirror the trends found in ethnic conflicts, wars, and genocides. The sex-selective extermination of Black males is an attempt to remove them from American civil society. Uh, this, this phenomena, if you call it, this pattern of death, so to speak, has been observable by scholars since the 19, late 60s and early 1970s. But what's puzzling here is that while we can reproduce and in many ways predict, predict that in an increasingly racist society, racialized men are going to be targeted and more brutally treated than their female counterparts, we seem to have an inability to grasp that intellectually. So intersexual invisibility suggests to us that, hey, even where we see this huge disparity in death of black men versus black women, or black men versus whites, we need to understand that black maleness, that male category, still entails a kind of privilege. As Purdy Vons and Ibox suggest, even though invisibility, not being seen as a threat within a patriarchal society, ultimately leads women to not be direct targets of oppression compared to subordinate men, subordinate men are not thought of as completely oppressed. They're still thought of as privileged within an androcentric society. So their privilege of death, being recognized by death, being killed, being exterminated, being hung, lynched, et cetera, being the first victims of genocide is read under intersexual visibility as a kind of privilege, right? This is a problem because when we're looking at what's happening in the United States, we understand that there are completely different systems or patterns of violence that's been directed towards Black men versus Black women. As Augustus Delzato explains, while the Black female threat can be controlled through policies of manipulation, right, the Black male as a threat requires the implementation of policies to, of direct force to keep him at the margins and policies of, a contain, of containment to ensure that he does not encroach upon the serenity of, a growing, of growing industrial parts and gated communities. So the United States has adopted sex-specific strategies that focus on the elimination of Black males from societies. Now, previous research going back to the 1970s designated this confluence of lethal violence in the prison industrial complex as a program of institutional decimation. However, contemporary research ignores the social, scientific, and comparative data showing the similarities between racialized groups throughout the world and the repetitive strategies of violence. Present theorizations concerning the death of Black people assert intuitive accounts of racial disparity as the basis of generalizable theory. So the impression a scholar has about the world or a set of events or an incident is theorized as fact without any investigation into the processes that are actually at work. And this is extremely important. So we've been guided to understand the kinds of catastrophes that happen in the real world through disciplinary and theoretical lens. We see huge disparities of, between black men and black women and black men and other groups being killed by police. But instead of us accepting simply that this is evidence of oppression, we somehow try to rationalize that the recognition of dead bodies, the recognition of dead black male corpses, in fact entails a kind of privilege. And this is one of the main theses that I, that I try to refute in my work because intersexual invisibility, while popular, nonetheless holds a contradictory view of violence under patriarchy that suggests while violence against women in patriarchal societies is evidence of their lower status and domination of the patriarchy, the greater levels of violence against racialized men in the very same society is not evidence of their oppression or their dehumanization, but rather their privilege as men. And this kind of paradoxical thinking is what I suggest ultimately leads to a kind of genocidal indifference towards the death of black men and boys that no amount of death, no amount of violence can ever overturn the analytic assumption that being male makes you privileged. But the, all the evidence we have, all the evidence that, that's constantly put before us, not only in terms of dead bodies, but also the lack or the inability of the society to fundamentally change or stop killing black men, suggests to us that there is no value, that there is no threshold of death that will ever inspire change. So the murder of, of George Floyd is no different. His death has yet to be explained as a product of the social historical forces and patterns of violence which anticipate population level effects. In interactions with the police, the escalation of violence towards black men is a far too often ignored aspect of police homicide and aggression. 
For example, in a recent study analyzing police stops in Ferguson, Missouri, the authors found sharp gender disparities in how black men and women are treated if they're questioned by the police. When black men challenged the police, it proved harmful for them as they were often handcuffed, jailed, or assaulted. Black women were more likely to question the police than any other tactic during police citizen encounters. And despite challenging officers' actions, they were generally free without adverse outcome. So black women, even when responding with more verbal aggression, did not cause the same escalation that black men did. This trend holds even in larger studies that are tracking the life course of police homicides. When we look at homicides due to police shootings, we understand that it's a generally male it's generally a male phenomenon. So the male variable holds across all race sex groups so much so that men of all races are as much as 20 times more likely to be shot by police than their female counterparts. As such, anti-black racism does not provide the kind of causal relationship to death by police that many theorists assert. Said differently, the overwhelming number of cases where police escalate to lethal violence resulting in death and their likelihood to escalate are predicated on race and maleness, not race or blackness alone. There are many male groups, including white men, more likely to be killed than, that, that are killed uh, more than black and other minority groups of women over their life course. Of these groups, Black males have the highest lifetime risk of being killed by police. According to a recent study by the sociologist Edwards Lee and Espito, quotes, among all groups, black men and boys face the highest lifetime risk of being killed by police. Now the authors explain that roughly 96 per 100,000 black men will be killed over life courses compared to 5.4 per 100,000 black women. Now, between the ages of 25 and 29, black men are killed by police at a rate of 2.8 to 4.1 per 100,000, whereas women's risk of being killed by police use of force is about an order of magnitude lower than men's risk of all ages. So between the ages of 25 to 29, they estimate a median mortality risk of 0.12 per 100,000 for black women. So contrary to the assertion that anti-blackness, right, so and when I'm talking about this, I'm saying the the general theories we have of intersectionality or Afro-pessimism, right? The, the assertion that anti-Blackness can sufficiently explain the, the racial or racist disparities of police homicide is simply false. Recent evidence suggests that being Black, but more distinctively, being a Black male in America seems to increase dramatically the chances that someone is likely to have an encounter with the police where the civilian ends up dead. Being Black and male, is a robust marker of who is likely to experience unfavorable and unfair outcomes in criminal justice and across other key sectors of American societies. Black males are the only group for which legal intervention is a leading cause of death. So the death of George Floyd, right? The death of George Floyd must be understood as a particular manifestation of these larger group dynamics, right? Even at the individual level, the evidence suggests that being a black male, being black and male is simply bad for one's health. So when you look at a graphic like this, and when you look at the lifetime risk per 100,000 of black men being killed compared to their other racial and ethnic counterparts, there's no other word that can express that disparity besides it being deliberate. It is not an accident that there is a sex difference between men and women in police killing. It's not an accident that there is a disparity between whites and other racial and ethnic minority groups that have groups of men who have been associated with terror, violence, and rape. These are not accidental products of our social historical moment, but our theories continue to treat them as such. Our accounts of why black men are killed are simply, well, white people are afraid of them. There must be some kind of racial antipathy or, or some aversion to Blacks. But then how do, you how do you explain the racial disparity? Are whites only afraid of Black men? Are they only afraid of Black men to the extent that they think Black men will kill them and Black women won't kill them? What is, the, what is the argument that we have to explain the mechanisms and processes? What are the studies that we have to explain the psychology of what makes whites shoot Black males more? 
And this is the problem, that in liberal arts, in our everyday theories, in our disciplinary orientation, we've not asked what kinds of rigorous thinking we need to actually investigate the killings of Black men and boys. We accept it as normal. We accept that racism means that Black men get killed or Black men get lynched, et cetera. But in terms of explaining the mechanisms, be they psychoanalytic, psychological, or simply social political, we've not been able to do because we don't have a refined system of thought that allows us to investigate the death and dying of Black men in the United States. Americans are in fact closely primed to perceive Black males as threats and engage them with lethal force. Right? In a recent study examining the tendency of white undergraduates, college educated white people, mind you, so these are not poor, uneducated white people, these are college-educated white people, to shoot race and gendered subjects, Ashby Plant, Joanna Goplin, and Jonathan Cussman found that participants tended towards mistakenly shooting the unarmed Black male subject, suspects more often than the unarmed Black female and unarmed white male and white female suspects. In contrast, when responding to armed suspects, participants were actually more likely to mistakenly not shoot the black male, the, the black female and white suspects of either gender than the black male suspects. So among whites with some college education, unarmed black men were still perceived as more of a threat than armed women of either race. Following this argument, established by social dominance theorists and to some extent intersexual visibility, the data is clear that when it comes to lethal violence at the hands of police or throughout American society, more generally, Black femaleness offers a more protective identity when compared to that of Black men. So there's something about being Black and male that's igniting as a talent for this kind of lethal violence. A more recent study found that Black boys, as young as five years old, still prime white shooters to perceive them as threats while Black girls did not. The authors of the study explained that, quote, prior work has found that threat-based racial biases are stronger for male than female adult targets. Furthermore, whereas white perceivers commonly display biases towards shooting unarmed black men in first-person shooter tasks, they display biases against shooting unarmed black women. So female gender thus modulates the threat-based racial biases at any age. Contrary to the popular intersectional accounts of gender, which insists that femaleness must necessarily add to and magnify racial bias, this data shows that femaleness actually deactivates racial stereotypes. So similar to the same kinds of graphs that we saw with McConaughey and White, there is something about maleness that intensifies the negativity associated with the global or the general group phenomena, racial phenomena. So consequently, Black maleness must be understood as a catalyst for the intensification of lethal violence and police homicide. George Floyd's death was not at all accidental. It was part, right? It was, it, 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 was, it was part of a dynamic that enabled whites to engage black males with complete disregard for their life for being. So the mere notion that black men and boys are threats that warrants extermination, where hearing a name associated with being black and male creates a fight or flight response in white men. This is a reality that remains empirically substantiated at multiple levels throughout social scientific research, but systematically denied within liberal arts and uh, liberal arts and humanist science fields and disciplines. So studying the disaggregation of groups, not the abstraction of categories, reveals really specific relationships and patterns that can't be identified conceptually. So George Floyd's death, and more recently the death of Mr. Wright, will continue to be replicated and denied as being a product of the strategies of elimination and subjugation tailored to black men. The proliferation of images and videos of his execution across the world show that while there may be outrage towards the acts against him, there's no offense taken by the displaying of his corpse. No amount of black men being shown to be killed will stop violence. The world, America, it relishes it, it craves it. It celebrates, it becomes a pornographic image that demonstrates the power that whites have over the black male beast. So the display of flaccid black male bodies has become routine. For some people a year ago, Mr. Floyd became a symbol of a new day. But the reality is that his death has not stopped the murder of more black men and boys in the United States. For example, 
In 2020, 225 black men were killed and two black women were shot by police. Now, because Mr. Floyd wasn't killed by police shooting, his death wasn't even tracked by the fatal force database kept by the Washington Post. Mr. Floyd is merely an instance of a system attempting to maintain white demographic and political superiority. Mr. Floyd is merely the expression of the racist worldview of America. Our remorse, the large and global political demonstrations over his death meant absolutely nothing in face of the political and legal structures and the social organization of America that's committed to black death. So our reliance on the good faith efforts of white individuals that can yield more power than other white groups has been shown to fail time and time again. But we eulogize Mr. Floyd as the start of something new until of course we get Mr. Right and then we do it all over again. Mr. Floyd's death was told, told, we were told that Mr. Floyd's death would demand clarity, right? The defunding of the police, deliberate action against the system that was designed to subjugate and kill black people through the elimination and removal of black men in the United States. Yet nothing happened. There's been various celebrations and praise for the efforts of black women's led political organization and, and leadership, but the reality is that over the last several years, black male death has simply not been affected by such symbolic efforts. Out of the 1,095 black people shot by police between 2015 and 2019 in the United States, 96% of those black people shot were black males. The National Geographic, which you should see on screen, recently ran a story depicting young black men as corpses in their mother's arms. The story, entitled for America's Black Mothers, the fear of loss and trauma is constant, ignores how black males come to grips with the likelihood of a violent end. Represented as the corpse of the American public, this lifeless pose is meant to remind white America of Mr. Floyd's lifeless body. And this is, and this is important, right? This image is important because while no one will or should dare to suggest that the black community, black mothers, sisters, daughters, et cetera, wives, don't suffer from the death of black men and boys, there's an issue of, of transference here, of transubstantiation, that the, that the death of black men is so normal, that black men and boys are so dehumanized, that their lives have no worth, that the only way we can understand what it's like for them to suffer is to empathize with the people that we recognize as human who have a loss for them. We can't empathize with the loss of black men and boys in this country. Shooting a little black boy is no different than shooting a criminal. Electrocuting a little black boy is no different than electrocuting or ridding itself of a threat. Every black boy is taken to be some murderer, criminal, or rapist. And America doesn't empathize with that. There's nothing in the value of that life, right, that can redeem or make them feel sorry or hold remorse for that death. So we present the black male corpse in the arms of a black woman who America could identify as, with as a mother right, as someone who lost someone. So the same way that Emmett Till's mother presented his body in a casket, brutalized for the world to see, and they saw her sobbing as a mother, that's the best that black men can hope for because no one weeps for black men as, black, as, as a life in their own, as having a life in their own or of their own. So Mr. Floyd's lifeless body, as the lifeless body of this young black male before you, conveys how the fear of a black male's doom is not, an, not his own. It doesn't belong to Mr. Floyd any more than it does any of these other young black boys or men. It is believed to be possessed by others, their mothers with whom the world can empathize. The black male is feared, but not relatable. He must be represented as a lifeless absence for reason and effect to thrive. It is this infuriating truth that explains why we must continue to celebrate the symbolic range of protests around Mr. Floyd, even though black male death has remained unchanged since the founding of Black Lives Matter. We should not insult Mr. Floyd's memory by appealing to the better selves of whites, which have not yet been manifested. His death is not and should not be used as an opportunity to have an audience with our oppressors. Black men die, we protest, we claim, that, we claim that they, the black male corpse, erases other victims, and then more black men die. So contrary to popular academic theories, which masquerade as, or, or, I, I'm sorry, contrary to the popular academic ideologies, which masquerade as theory, 
It is the death of black men and boys that drive and determine the maladies of blackness. Black mobility, or I'm sorry, black men have the lowest life expectancy, the highest rates of mortality, and the greatest economic downward mobility of any race sex group in the United States. But despite these deleterious demographic realities, Mr. Floyd is not thought to be the inevitable consequence of these systems. So anti-blackness is deployed as a generic causal category within contemporary theory. What I mean by this is these theories assert that racism is a phenomenon that affects all black people to the same degree and with the same intensity across the board. So due in no small part to the influence of intersectionality, these scholars and theorists assume that the disadvantage imposed upon blacks gains specificity as various sexual identities speciate the racial experience. As such, the assumption that blackness is normatively situated as male assumes privilege and a lessened degree of suffering, right? I'll say that again. Within our intersectional logic, the racial, the category of maleness assumes a form of privilege and a lessened degree of suffering. And this idea, this ideological or analytic assertion stands against all reason and all available evidence and known fact. And it's because these kinds of intersexual conceptualizations of black death and disadvantage are deployed in a seemingly impenetrable logic that says that it's black males who are privileged and invulnerable to certain forms of violence, that they're primarily experienced by those who are not black males. Black men then are thought to only suffer from the general racism that all black people endure. Such accounts do not start with the violence present in the world, like the death of Mr. Floyd and Mr. Wright and the hundreds like him. These, these accounts begin with abstractions of identity that's used to imagine disadvantage that is quite distinct from what can be observed in the actual world. A serious theorization of blackness must account for the ways that anti-blackness functions in the world, not merely how one thinks about what can be represented. But as it currently stands, intersectional discourse appropriates black male disadvantage and death as racism, are the experiences of all black people while then erasing black male positionality and suffering as an effect of male privilege. Said differently, every other black group may claim black male death and dying as disadvantageous under the racial category, but the black men and boys who in fact die because their maleness means that they're somehow privileged. Now, even when we consider more radical theoretical orientations such as Afro-pessimism, it still fails to disaggregate racial violence into demographic patterns of death and societal disadvantage. Wilson, for instance, argues that it's the, quote, Black position that is uh, less a site of subjectification, more a site of desubjectification, a species of absolute dereliction, a body that magnetizes bullets, end quote. I would contend that some black bodies magnetize bullets more than others, and it is these bodies that lack explanation within this framework. What produces race-sex differentiation under Wilderson's account of black positionality? If all blacks are the slaves, then why do we not see equal rates of murder, equal rates of homicide, equal rates of downward mobility? What is it about blackness that allows us to speciate? And why then is it that when we consider sex, we assume that it's only disadvantageous and does not have nuance? Wilderson's analysis describes the overrepresentation, or should I say the overdetermination, right, of black male vulnerability as a property of blackness, not maleness, while other forms of violence like rape and other gender-based stigmas are specifically linked to black femininity, black queerness, or black trans bodies. While black maleness may in fact show greater propensity, if not causal relation to police killings and white vigilantism, black maleness has no conceptual mode of vulnerability. It simply is and remains synonymous to race. So contrary to the dogmas of contemporary theory, a substantial amount of empirical work in sociology, psychology, and economics has shown that racism is in fact a misandric aggression. To say this means that the deaths of black men, their, 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 their deaths as spectacles, deterrence to future protests against America's racial order, that these, that these displays of violence are primarily designed to punish and isolate black men from society. And there will be more George Floyds. And when they die at the hands of whites, they too will lack any real explanation in theory. So the inability of black scholars to think about anti-black racism sociologically, scientifically, and philosophically dooms any serious effort to actually lessen police violence. The refusal to explain the disproportionate numbers of deaths or the more brutal and lethal violence against black men is ideological and merely reproduces the version the United States has towards the lives of black men and boys. 
Black academics and activists have committed themselves to the deliberate misconstruing of George Floyd's murder and the hundreds of black men and boys in the process. And I think that when we look at the kinds of academic tropes and theories that are consistently put around black men, specifically cis black men's bodies and identities, calling for abolition, suggesting that black men are trash, looking at this historically suggests that not only that there's indifference, but there's a deliberate promulgation of the kinds of misandric aggressions and stereotypes that show that these groups of men are isolated from the moral universe that we hold in civil society. And despite the amount of work, the amount of hard data, the numbers, the demographics, the statistics, the survival curves that are consistently showing that black men are at the bottom with the lowest life expectancy, et cetera, scholars remain indifferent. Disciplines remain indifferent. Hiring committees remain indifferent. Refusing to hire scholars that, that focus on black men and boys. In this moment, where we are all supposedly outraged at black male death. These contradictions cannot continue to be ignored. Black male studies is pushing back on the idea that indifference be allowed to stand in a world that claims that it's interested in the moral and existential thriving of human beings. And if black men and boys continue to be exterminated without any re remorse or recourse to at least, at least analyzing that phenomenon in a, in, a, in a scholarly and disciplinary apparatus, right? There, there can only be the expectation of more doom because we're not training people. We're not allowing scholars to even think about what could be possible solutions, right? We've continued to castigate and relegate black men to the realm of the non-human without, without any regard for what we may be losing. So this presentation was just a, a brief intervention, uh, I hope, into how not only contemporary theory in the liberal in liberal arts or the humanist sciences have failed us, but also the necessary interventions that I think and the new and the new language, the new understandings that we need to truly get our head around the continuing death and dying of black men and boys in the United States. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for your powerful talk, Dr. Curry. So at this point, we, we do have time for question and answer. Um, I'd say feel free to populate uh, using the Q&A tab, any questions that you might have. Um, I, I'll, I'll start us off with a question. Um, so myself being a, uh, a former high school teacher, a current uh, teacher educator, I just wonder if you wanna comment a bit on the role that K-12 schools play in um, the promulgation of Black death? And maybe also, are there avenues for social change that can take place within K-12 schools? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, I think it's difficult. I mean, I, I, it really depends on what view of American society you take. I mean, I, I tend towards a more, you know, racial realist perspective from critical race theory. I don't think education overturns racism. Uh, I think when the majority of uh, teachers in K through 12 are white women, I think when we look at white women's attitudes, their constructions of black males specifically, um, there's, little, there's little hope for revolutionary or radical transformation. So the idea is that if we change how people think, if we change how the children think, right? This was the assumption of the Warren Court and Brown v. Board of Education, that somehow will lead to social transformation. That, you know, as Alport said, the contact between individuals will fundamentally change the hearts and minds of whites. And we've seen time and time again that there is a resistance that whiteness has to the humanity of blackness, that no amount of theory or no amount of contact allows whites to fundamentally change and not want to assume a superior position within the social hierarchy against black people. And I think that many times our liberal thinkers in education have overestimated the impact that education can have in this regard. Not because they're bad scholars or bad thinkers, but because they were given a certain ideological premise by the Supreme Court in the 1950s, right? That build scholarly consensus around a certain idea. And 50, 60 years later, we're still living with that assumption. We're living with the idea that we can educate people out of racism, 
not remembering that it's people like Robert Carter and Derrick Bell who said that they messed up with Brown v. Board of Education because they assumed that the heart, the origin of white supremacy was segregation and not, in fact, the white supremacy that was part and parcel of all of white America, part of the society itself. So if we look at this seriously, we're educating children in the school system that still requires them to live in a white supremacist society that marks social hierarchies based on the assumption of white superiority and black inferiority. So I don't think education in that regard changes social structure. In fact, I think what it does is it creates a hope in kinds of democratic processes and dialogical resolution uh, that means that grassroots organizing, black solidarity, and even radical organizing, right? Black power, black panthers, even you know, armed resistance um, become untenable because that's not what civilized educated people do. But then how do we explain the brutalization and the brutality that black men and boys suffer in this society, in this alleged civil society, right? Um, I don't think education, our K through 12 education is certainly equipped to deal with that kind of reality. Thank you for that response. I There are some questions that um, folks have submitted. Uh, so considering that lethal violence is used against black men and boys at significantly higher rates, what is your, what is your take on defunding the police? Or what else do you think it might take to stop the murder of black men and boys at the hands of police? <sighs> Great question. Uh, I think the conversations around defunding have pretty much halted um, after the election. Uh, and again, you know, I think this speaks to what happens when white people are bored um, because they're stuck in the house with the pandemic and need liberal causes. Uh, so defunding is not going to happen. It's not uh, after the Supreme Court decision in Graham. Uh, there is there is police feel more empowered, not less. So there's no mechanism. There's no loss of faith even even by the either by the public or the judiciary that's making people suspect that the police are untrustworthy or no longer a legitimate or repressive societal institution um given that defunding i think is not going to ever happen um how do you actually decrease the deaths well this is a great question uh we need less police interaction uh with minority populations especially black men uh, we need policies that that shift the burden of proof Right, given that we have so much evidence that uh, we, we have to change the preponderance of truth, right? We, there's so much evidence showing that there is a bias against black men, right? That we need, we need a different kind of ruling. We need a different kind of start decisis that doesn't allow police to get the benefit of the doubt if they commit these crimes against black males. We need a black male standard, so to speak. Um, and ultimately, ultimately, you know, the pro see the problem with this is we know what would work, but we know that what would work would never happen because of the structure of the society. And I think this, the problem is that scholars who study this kind of material are expected in many ways to give solutions to something that can't be solvable. So if we accept any of the tenets of critical race theory or social dominance theory or black male studies or Afro-pessimism, you know, pick your poison. Um, there is a seeming permanence to racism in American society. And once we accept that our society is a group-based social hierarchy, not individual-based, but group-based, where members of certain groups have an assumed privilege of power over members of other groups, then we also have to accept that there are certain kinds of means and mechanisms by which those groups maintain their hierarchical position. The killing of Black men is one of those. We've seen this in genocides. We've seen it in low-level conflicts. We've seen it in ethnic conflicts. We've seen it in segregation. Hell, you know, you you pick at any point that you want to eliminate a group of people, you eliminate their males first, right? And I think that we see this process unfold in the United States. So unless we're going to do something like abolish the police or have a civil war, the domination of racialized men through police killing, incarceration, deportation will continue to white supremacist society. Unfortunately, I think Sedanius is correct that these are the mechanisms by which subordinate racialized males are both managed and maintained so their population doesn't overthrow or become threatening to the dominant racial group. And until we accept that and start thinking of case-specific strategies, right, that can be used to intervene at specific local and state levels to stop the murder of Black men, uh, this is just going to continue. And what I and what I, I like to point out to the person who asked the question is, I know that's a pessimistic take, but if you think backwards, 
before police killing became a hot topic. Think about the stories of every black male in civil rights, in black power, right, in, the, in, in SNCC that were met with police. These people were eliminated, lynched, castrated, disappeared, right? Fred Hampton was assassinated, right? Every story that we have of black civil rights leaders, male civil rights leaders, is that they're dead. So we understand as part of our historical memory that America is a deadly place for black men, even when they take up the position of more righteousness and social transformation. So if we can kill someone like Martin Luther King and Fred Hampton and Huey P. Newton, what makes us think that somehow there's something in the 21st century that's going to arrest the practices of the last century? What's going to change the, the practices and patterns of domination of the last hundred years? So that's my way of saying I don't think it's solvable unless there's going to be a radical societal transformation. And by that, I mean a an un, uh, civil war, unrest, collapse of the economy. These are the kinds of things. You need something that's going to break the hierarchy, break up the society. Beyond that, I think that this is one of the ways that, they main, that the society maintains order. I think this question might be somewhat similar. Um, but I think it's intriguing. Uh, so seeing that Black Lives Matter has significantly framed the way that we view Black men in society now, including what appears to be the refusal to specifically talk about anti-Black misandry, how should we be looking at ideological movements like Black Lives Matter that claim to be interested in ending police violence? With suspicion, <laughs> right? Don't trust them. It's don't listen. You know, I, I used to tell my classes when I was back in the United States, why are we not asking the very same questions of BLM that we would any other representative? Do you have the interests of the people you claim to represent at heart? Do your policies and practice benefit the poor working black cl the class of black folk that you claim that you represent? Has your actions over the last six, seven years led to a decrease in death? in those populations. And if they answer to any of those questions or no, then they're lying. I've seen Cadillac commercials. I'm in Europe, so you know I see these things late. Um, you know, Warner Brothers, somebody just bought millions of dollars of homes, right? These are these are these are black women who don't even represent the poor black women in black communities, much less the poor black men. So the question we have to ask ourselves then is why are these leaders right being designated and rewarded? Again, Every this is this is what frustrates me. This is what frustrates me because it's, it's like we're so ideologically confined to think what people tell us. You're telling me that as an academic, I walk into the academy, I take black studies, I take gender studies, et cetera. I'm going to hear a whole history about how these poor working class black men from the South and the North during segregation had a whole civil rights movement that excluded black women's interests and benefited from patriarchy. All of them ended up dead, and the group that they said they were benefiting, most of the black men ended up poor because the jobs went to white women and then educated black women, right? This is how we got the gender disparity in higher ed. So that's the truth. So the facts say, well, black men really didn't have any empirical benefit, but you had a class of black men, certainly, right, that, that benefited from integration. But that's what I'm supposed to believe there. You fast forward to our time, alleged with the same suspicion of civil rights, and I have a whole class of people who work for nonprofits that are bed with white liberals, they're getting funded and have connections to the Democratic National Party and platform, and I raise no questions about their leadership. People who are getting rich, billion, buying million dollar homes, nobody's killed these women. Nobody's exiled these women, but that's what's happened to, to the black people, specifically the black men of the 60s and 70s. You see, we've, we've become numb, right, to actually asking questions. Why, how is it possible that black, poor black men are dying and being killed by cops and then the people representing them to white society become millionaires? Signing deals with Warner Brothers and, and Cadillac. Nobody finds that suspicious. But at the same time, you want to castigate people who are still in jail, in isolation, in exile, because they shot at cops and they've defended themselves during, during the black power and the civil rights movement. You see, this tells us something about the lack of seriousness we have in studying the history of Black people. And it tells us something about our own political commitments, that we could look at this dynamic, want to castigate people who are dead, shot, et cetera, as trying to benefit from patriarchy or capitalism or whatever the case may be, but at the same time celebrate these people who are not even from the poor communities 
of the people who are being shot by police when they get million dollar deals. So, so BLM needs to be looked at with suspicion. It needs to be analyzed. It needs to be debated. And I'm not saying that you, you, that, that you have to go completely negative or castigate the whole movement, but we're not even allowed to ask basic questions. Even when I when BLM came out and I started raising these kinds of questions, people suggested, "Oh, it's because you you don't what you don't support uh, feminism or intersectionality or female all irrelevant. These are distractions. These are red herrings. None of that answers the question: Do they fix the problem they claim that they're supposed to fix? And until we get the kind of intellectual courage to start having these debates in, in, as students or as academics, then you can't change the ideology." Because every time something happens to a black person, every time a movement starts on the streets, the idea is that black scholars have to conform. We have to conform and confirm. We are all in support of these ideas. But what happened to the skeptical moment? What happened to us, our critical thinking, right? We're not allowed to have that because we have to be on the same page. So I think BLM is very dangerous, not in the sense that it's failed, right? I think it has empirically failed, but because it wasn't allowed to be questioned. And if the questioning resulted in them changing or the question resulted in us having a different understanding, that's one thing. But being not allowed to question it and have your career threatened if you do, I think that's the kind of problem. So I think we should look at it with, with, with extreme suspicion. So a question, this is more of a, a history question. Um, so switching gears a bit. In your view, were Black men as opposed to Black women particularly vulnerable to violence during the era of chattel slavery? If so, how, and if not, when did this particular vulnerability emerge and why? I mean, that's a hard question because during slavery, they didn't divide gender up the way they do now. I mean, you know, if you look at Melissa Stein's book, uh, Measuring Manhood, she'll give you a very specific account of the end of slavery. I think most of this is post-emancipation ideology, because these are when the theories of sexology and ethnography and uh, ethnology started really being developed. Um, during slavery, I think there was a lot of equality. Of course, the idea of the Black man as a rapist, but Douglas didn't think that, that was really in play a lot then. So I would say post-1865, and the biggest thing that drove mu much of the social ethnology during that period of time was rape and the threat that Black men posed to uh, women and children. So that's what would make that's what would that's what would speciate the kinds of violence. I don't think that it's a situation where black men have always and forever been more vulnerable to violence than black women. This is, you know, there's nothing that lasts forever. I think that after emancipation, because you're in a patriarchal society, this kind of kinship relation developed, and because of anti-miscegenation and the idea of black men being rapists, which was false, and you know, the notion that you know you organize, and this is dollars work, that you organize segregation for white men's sexual gains so they can have access to black women and white women and you keep black men out. These are the kinds of things that, that gave rise to what we're dealing with today, not some innate issue that started with slavery and continued forward. All right, we have a lot of great questions. I'm kind of sifting through here. So um, there's been a few questions, maybe maybe stemming from my original question on K-12 education. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask one of them. So other than sure. quote unquote anti-racist material and education in schools, mm -hmm. what else should be done to enforce action for anti-racism across faculty and school districts? And I'd probably actually so K-12, but I'd, I'd probably actually add um, universities as well. So like K-20? Yeah. Um, look, I mean, but this is the problem. White people control all the resources. You know, and this, again, I don't, I, you know, <laughs> white people control the resources. So when they hire Black people, they're going to hire Black people that are align with the establishment, not against it. So it depends what you're trying to do. If for you, anti-racism means more black representation, then you could push that on hiring committees, right? But if for you, anti-racism means that you're actually decreasing racism and practices of racism, you don't hold any power. So the kinds of struggles and resistance that you engage in would have to be incremental and instrumental. You have specifically, what are you trying to do? Improve the quality of X group, right? At this time, at this university. Now, until black people or other brown folks get enough economic and structural power to change how white people behave and act, then there's not much you can do. And that's the problem we keep running into. That we, we, I mean, if you think of any, here's the funny thing. 
if you think of higher education, if you go to any department, right, you will probably find a good sect of white women. So you ask yourself, how is it that black and brown folks were on the streets marching, gave up their lives, have great civil rights leaders, right? Fought for race, fought against racism, were radicals, et cetera. But when it comes to allocating resources, white women got most of it. Now, is that because white women fought harder for the rights they have? Or is that because white people as a group need white women to reproduce, so it's easier to deal with white women than a whole bunch of black and brown people, right? These things are not are not based on the agency or the kinds of resistance or the efforts that oppressed people have. It's based on what the oppressor class is willing to distribute. So when white women became minorities, you want to help minorities, distribute all of it to white women, that helps enrich your house and your communities. You don't see the same kind of effect happening in the black and brown communities in the United States. So when we ask those kinds of questions, what else could be done? It really does mean, what do you mean by anti-racism? Because you're really anti-racist, you're going to be anti-liberal. You're going to be anti-feminist in a certain way. You're going to be against white representation and management and control of resources. And that's going to make you anti-establishment and often unemployed, right? So if you, if you want to challenge these things, if you're serious about challenging these things, you're going to have to limit yourself to what white liberals are going to allow. And if you don't and you criticize white liberals and feminists and other white people who claim to be allies but really lie to you in your face because they really only have a particular kind of black person they want, you know, then you do things like move outside the United States and take up really cool positions at ancient universities, right? But you have to make decisions because there is nothing that's going to happen through K through 12 outside of specific policies, right? More black teachers, more black male teachers, different curricula, et cetera, that's going to change anything. And that's only institutionally, right? That's not going to fundamentally change the structure and the patterns of violence and hierarchy through American society. And we have to be very specific about that. Right, so if you want a small instrumental or incremental change to some effect, I think that's possible. If you want a larger societal transformation, I think that that I think it's unlikely. Right. Uh, so you mentioned your move to out of the U.S., but I, there's a couple of questions about that, and maybe mm -hmm. if we'll get to that in a second. But I, I wanted to. So there is a question about um, specifically police officers and. The question is, I wonder if increasing the number of black men police police officers will help to reduce the number of death of black men harmed and killed by police. And I've, I've heard this as a common argument as a, a mm. possible intervention. I mean, it's possible, but it hasn't been tested. I mean, we know that black men, just like any other group, black women, whites, et cetera, can internalize negative stereotypes about black males and other groups. like. You know, it's part of the policing culture, right? It's who you're defining as the threat. I think you're probably more likely, <laughs> right, to get some positive motivation, but there's no way that the majority of, of police officers in the United States are going to become black males. White people are not going to let that happen, right? See, and this is this is what I mean about the practice, the, the practicality of it. So in a world where black men are made police officers to respond to white men killing black people, black boy, men and boys, and, and black women and girls, White people empower more black people to have guns to lethally kill. They're not going to do that. They're not going to do that. So um, is it a possible intervention? Sure. In some areas, maybe in Minnesota, this would be something that could possibly work, right? Especially if you're giving those black men certain kind of power to intervene against their white partners or against other whites in the police force. Is this going to happen nationally on a large scale? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And one of the reasons it won't is because the st overwhelming stereotype uh, that whites have of blacks is that they're violent and uncontrollable, especially black men, right? They're not going to empower them to, to, to lethally use violence. It's not going to happen. You saw what happened to the, that, 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 um, I believe African or, or, or a police officer that shot the white woman that was acting erratic. He went to jail, right? And that's a, I think that's a great example, right, of, of the difference. You can shoot a 12 year old boy like Tamir Rice and it's justified. A white woman comes out running erratically where a black man says he feared for his life, he's in jail, right? This is, is, is not gonna make that much of an effect, right? In my view, in my view. I, so I had originally written a question before your talk about you personally and how you sustain yourself in the work. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find the question. There was a question about your move out of the US. Mm -hmm. um, let me see if I can find it. Uh, 
All right, here it is. And I, and I don't know if this relates to my question about sus sustaining yourself or not, but no, no, uh, please, yeah. as, we, as we struggle in this country as black men, as we have for our entire history, what do you think of leaving the United States as a strategy, either on a personal level, level or as a movement or goal for black organizations to escape mm -hmm. this violence and make actual change in our lives? I think it's something that should be explored. Uh, my move from the United States was extremely positive precisely because the first thing that crosses the minds of people outside the United States when they talk about black men is not rapist or is not per, you know, patriarch or any of these other negative things that were called in the United States uh, by other academics and feminists. So there's an ability, especially in Europe, I think to connect with the experiences that black men have um, as 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 fighters, as resistance figures, um, that doesn't exist in the United States. Uh, so I think it is a plausible strategy. However, the rest of the world is racist. You know, I don't want to build up, you know, the UK or Europe as if it's not. You know, uh, you know, I was in a debate with um, a, a historian. And he was like, well, I don't have to listen to basically a black, a black man who calls himself a philosopher do X. And in Europe, they're very tame. So, you know, I'm not European. So I was like, look, let's talk about the inadequacy of this person who's doing X, Y, Z. And the, I was framed by the national press as being enraged, <laughs> right? So these stereotypes of black men exist everywhere. Uh, but nonetheless, you don't have the kind of hateful violence against black men the same way, you know, in, in other parts of Europe as you have in the United States. That's not to say there's not police violence and killings, but you don't get the same amount. Like the gun culture and the white vigilantism and the and the academic disregard for black male life that you find throughout the academy doesn't exist in European universities, largely because there's no black people. But that that provides an opportunity for for young black male scholars, I think, in a way that we don't have here in the United States. Um, but, you know, and, and to relate to your question about self-sustaining, you know, I, I chose a field and I chose a topic that I knew defended the most dehumanized group on the face of the earth. You know, nobody says anything positive about black men and boys, despite all the evidence showing that they're the most progressive groups of people in the United States. And I've confronted people time and time again with this evidence, you know, because much of this evidence is actually done by feminists. So, you know, it's like even when you're reading feminine, white and black feminists on this question of black men's attitudes and their voting behaviors and, and their notions of e political equality and so societal opportunity, um, people don't want to deal with that. Right. They just don't want to deal with it. And the reason they don't want to deal with it is because it's so just just so adamantly refutes any notion they have. You know, I mean, I've been in arguments with people who are utilizing bell hooks, you know, and her lack of citations against, you know, actual data, like regressions and, you know, things of this sort. There's no, there's no debating with these people. And I, and for a long time, I would become frustrated. You know, I, I remember when I first started uh, talking about black male victims of sexual assault, you know, I started off with all the data and all the philosophers were like, oh, this doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There's no stories. I don't know any people. So I brought the stories and they're like, well, this isn't a big enough phenomenon to care. Right. So then I was like, you got the stories, you got the prevalence. What else do you need? It's just a disregard. And I think that once I accepted the depth of anti-black misandry, that there's just a real hatred of black men in American society and in various parts of the world, then it frees you, right? It's kind of how Du Bois understood himself to be a problem. It frees you to start exploring and, and un imagining new possibilities because there's no amount of rational conversation, debate or argumentation that's gonna fundamentally change the way people view you. So I sustain myself through that kind of affirmation, doing good work and trying to intervene in the practices that are destroying young black men and boys. And I'll be very honest with you, I've had tremendous success with mothers and, and wives that, that have written to me and, and they, they're getting, you know, their husbands or fathers, my books, and they're talking to them. And, and, and even black men who are survivors, you know, saying that, you know, my books have helped them, you know, get back in touch with, you know, why they stopped talking to their family because of histories of sexual abuse, et cetera. Those are the types of things that I concentrate on, you know, and, and it's tremendously rewarding to be a philosopher that, that can actually help the people you're intending to help. And it's, of course, that's different than being a celebrity intellectual, but I work with victims. I care about what's happening to Black families in poor Black neighborhoods. You know, in, in that regard, I think my work's been tre tremendously successful. So that's that's kind of what I focus on. And you just, you just look at everything else as white noise.
appreciate that answer. I, as you were talking, I was wondering, well, I couldn't, I couldn't um, help but like sort of compare myself as, as a young mm -hmm. black scholar in the academy. Um, do you have any specific advice for either black scholars that are um, engaging in research on, on black boys or black males uh, in the academy um, or just scholars of color in general about how they should you know, approach their research? Listen, that's a great question. I, I tell people all the time that I'm not a role model <laughs> because, <laughs> uh, because I think I got myself in a lot of trouble as a young scholar. Um, you know, I've only been out of the academy or in the academy for 11 years. Um, but I think there's two things. I didn't enter the academy with the idea that white people were going to like me. I'm a first generation black male from late Charles, Louisiana. I'm a generation removed from illiteracy. My grandfather was a brilliant man, but he couldn't read. So I don't come from an environment where I had expectations that white people or really anyone else would like me. I, I, I believed in the myth of black solidarity because that's what I grew up around. A bunch of poor black people that helped each other, that understood each other. Uh, but that's not what I what I got when I entered the academy because I it was for the it was the it was the academy that taught me there are class differences <laughs> between black folk that I had absolutely no clue about. Um, so you have to make a choice, and my choice was was that all I knew how to do I'm you know I didn't have any any mentorship in that way where you know I came up through college on debate scholarships so my art the only thing I knew how to do was research and win arguments so that's how I ran my academic career. You said something, I wrote an article about it. You told me that I didn't know something, I researched it, and I showed that I knew it right. I took a very kind of debate-oriented posture towards knowledge. I acquired it, and I used it to beat down other arguments that were saying things. That has an effect. The effect of it is that you're not going to be liked by many of the people who have power because nobody likes to be told that they're wrong. And they certainly don't like to be shown they're wrong by somebody who doesn't have the certain class background and pedigree that they think entitles them to say anything to them. The other thing it does though, is that if you have the kind of confidence and a tremendous faith in what you're able to do, it positions you outside of those debates. So it means that you get to set your own path in terms of what your academic career looks like. I went from an assistant professor to a full professor in seven years. I went from a full professor to a distinguished professor in two. So in nine years of being in the academy, despite being massively unpopular because of my theories on critical race theory, racism, and black men, I nonetheless hold a distinguished professorship at one of the top 20 universities in the world, in a department that's never hired a black person since the founding of the line. Now, most people would say that's impressive, but there's consequences to that. And I guess the question that young scholars have to ask themselves is what do you want to be remembered by? If you want to be liked, have lots of social mobility and wooed by various top 50 departments in the country, definitely don't do what I did, <laughs> right? Because you're not going to make a lot of friends. But if you're the type of person who's like, I want the work to stand, I want to be remembered after everyone else dies, then I think you have a different choice. The people in my own time are not going to appreciate this work because we're, we're ideologically fixed on intersectionality. People haven't even read the work, but intersectionality solves the problem. Whoa. You know, that's because because we live in a, t in a mode of thinking, right? That's just our mode of thinking right now, that you've been formulated to believe that every answer, every question ever asked about Black men can be dealt with by Black feminist intersectionality. And that's fine. That's how, that's why people live and people die, right? But in 20, 30 years, people are going to say, well, there's some things here that we're not understanding. Why are Black men still reporting high rates of rape? The law changed in 2013. Why do we see this effect 20, 30 years down the line? I wonder who's written about that. Oh, Curry saw that problem 30 years ago. Well, he's an old man now. Maybe we should see what he thinks before he dies. <laughs> you know, like these are the kinds of this is this is this is because you're invested in increasing the archive of human knowledge. If you're if you're humanist oriented, then you're going to say that part of the humanist science is to expand the way and the kinds of ideas that we have as knowledge, what we consider as knowledge. And my contribution is that. What are we now? Because we have black male studies, you may not like it. Other people may not like it, but it fundamentally contributes to a new way of thinking about black men and boys. It fundamentally contributes a different way of thinking about racialized men, right? Because I discovered that Jewish men were victims of rape during the Holocaust. It's changing the way that we consider these acts of violence around the male category. And of course, that's going to be unpopular now, but in a few years, in a few decades, maybe when we're all dead and gone, the reality of what we see now is going to have to be explained. Someone's going to try to explain it. And it's in that moment 
right? That you get validation for what your life was worth because you've contributed something to the way that human beings understand their humanity and what they're trying to explain throughout human history. But if you want big paychecks, et cetera, that's a different path. So yeah, I think, I think that's the best advice I could give you. The academy is not fair. It's not just. It's extremely cliquish. It's extremely classist. Um, and it really doesn't care about poor Black people. If you're one of the scholars who actually makes your life studying poor Black people and victims and people who are hurt, um, that's not going to be a popular orientation because it's going to put you out of line with the heroes and heroines of your discipline. But that's a price that many people choose to pay, and then they're fine, right? So it's, it's ultimately the choice of the kind of scholar and the kind of life that you want to have, and more importantly, how you want history to remember you. I appreciate that honest answer, and a lot there's a lot of great advice in there. Um, yeah, it's a lot of great advice in there. Uh, this might be closely related to some of the things you said about um, sort of like black male studies and possibly the future of black male studies. Um, but there's a question, and this is specific to the academy. So should we should we view the response from the academy like certain frameworks, um, specifically anti-racist frameworks, as another form of disaggregating disaggregating the death of black men? And should there be race specific strategies? So I mean it would depend how what they mean by anti-racist strategies. I what I'm arguing is that claims about black men that only are accounted for by racism are inadequate to explain black male reality. So until we can get our hands around the idea of maleness as a deleterious or disadvantageous category of existence, we'll never be able to understand what makes black men vulnerable in the United States. So I don't, but I don't know what strategies the person who asked the question have in mind. Um, I think that there is a place, listen, black women do terribly when you compare them to white women. Right, but they do better than black men on most demographic markers, and they do worse than ever, practically everybody else. You know, this is why I'm saying like there is no universal rule. You just have to compare them to the group you're comparing them to. If you want an anti-racist strategy, then you have to solve the problem and the disparities that these groups of people have compared to the group you're comparing them to. So if I'm looking at black men to black women, what do I have to control for? Well, black men have a lower life expectancy, more unemployment, less educated, less social mobility, et cetera. Like that's if you want to adjust black men to black women's position, that's what you have to solve. If you want to look at black people and make like a more general view of how black people exist to white people, then you have to make the same kind of comparisons, but you're going to find, as people like Chene and Hendren did, there's the income disparity between white men and black men that's driving black the the, uh, the failure of black wealth and social mobility. Black women and white women generally have the same kind of social mobility. You can say that those women don't have the same kind of mobility as a white men, but they're not going to. So the question is, how do you adjust for what's going on? You know, that's what I mean. Like, this is a complicated field, and you have to know a lot of different stuff and a lot of different fields to come up with genuine solutions. One of the reasons that I pursued my, my degree in um, epidemiology is I'm interested in how violence travels in the Black community, right? But that's a very complicated story. It's not just about class. It's all about neighborhood, rates of violence in neighborhoods. It's about certain kind of dispositions, right? Certain kinds of notions of prevalence, right? And different things have different associations and significance when you're running them through different models. So if you want real anti-racism, first know what you're talking about as racism and understand what group-based social hierarchy actually means. I think a lot of people now with the anti-racist literature and language simply are talking to white people, white privilege, white bias, white fragility, et cetera. That does nothing to help black people, right? You can tell white people they're bad people all day and they'll pay you a lot of money to do it. And it has not a single effect on black people that's gonna be held or, 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 or adopted. And again, this is, this is what I meant when I say the kind of money you wanna make. I'm interested in creating protocols that are gonna be utilized by clinicians to actually help people who've been victims of sexual assault and rape. People don't care about that right now. I'd be better served if I was talking about how patriarchal black men were and how white people need to be better white people. But nobody telling white people to be better white people saves black people's lives because the white people who listen to you aren't the racist pulling the triggers. So you have, to, you have to accept that if you want to decrease racism, you have to have an interest in protecting the lives of the people who are being disproportionately affected by it, right? And in order to do that, you have to get into some really messy, empirical, and community-based work that I don't think a lot of scholars are really that interested in. Other than yourself, are there particular scholars that are writing about anti-racism that you believe are partic 
are, are, are hitting at things that are particularly important because I know a common, oh, yeah. a common oh, yeah. thing, a common thing has flourished amongst teachers and teacher educators is like sort of like, okay, let's form an anti-racist book club. And it does yeah, a lot of the yeah. books that do get read in those circles are the types of books that are going to, you know, further certain white liberal narratives. Yeah. Are there certain yeah, scholars absolutely. that it's you would, the New York Times bestseller? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. You know, I mean, look, they're having this problem in the UK. They want to form anti-racist book clubs, but then they're reading just the the the, the black people on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, so the first thing is, you know, um, Darity and Mullen, right? Their book on reparations, I think, is a must read. Uh, you know, Derek Hamilton's work is fantastic. Trevon Logan's work in economics is fantastic. Um, some of the stuff on wealth disparity and in, in, um, in, in prisons, you know, uh, Evelyn Patterson uh, works in democracy out in Vanderbilt, does great work on, on, on wealth attribution, income, and years loss of work in prison and uh, in, in prison and incarceration. Uh, people who are doing like black political theory, uh, people like Michael Sawyer, just wrote a great book on on uh, Malcolm X. Really, really enjoy enjoy his work. Uh, there's new scholars coming out with books in Black Male Studies uh, now. You know, uh, Norman Ajari is a Black philosopher up there at uh, Villanova, doing really great work on these issues. I mean, these are the people who I read. I'm mean, kind of biased, but you know, these are people who are investigating the relationship between political violence, blackness, black maleness, and and income disparity. Right? Um, you know, Thomas Levine's work in public health. You know, these, these, these people are trying to figure out how racial disparities are actually translated into things in, in the world, right? Uh, those are people who I think have their heads on right. I'm not interested in people having idealistic and abstract formulations of how racism works because we bought into some ontological or diagnostic theory, but then can't translate that. Now, that's not me taking away from those projects, right? I think, I think projects like Afro-pessimism, Afro-optimism, I think these are interesting intellectual projects, but these are abstractions that don't really help us contextualize the kinds of disaggregated data that we find in police killings or even COVID-19 deaths. You know, I recently published an article um, entitled Condition for Death. It was in um, the Comparative American Studies Journal or something like that. And one of the reviewers were like, well, Afro-pessimists have already dealt with COVID-19 deaths. I'm like, how? You know, I mean, you know, and that's what I'm saying. I was, I was like, where's the article on Afro-pessimism and COVID-19? I've seen some commentaries, but the translation is like, well, Black people are killed more. But when you look at the data, not exactly. It's not like Black people, like Indigenous people have a higher rate of death. You know, um, I think at one point Hispanics had a higher rate of death. How do you explain the sex disaggregation that when you look at Black men compared to Black women, Black men have a higher rate of death? How do you explain this just with the idea of, of, of gratuitous violence? Again, not taking away from what I think Afro-pessimism does in intervening into questions of humanism and liberalism, et cetera, but what does it have to do with epidemiology? You know, and this is the problem I have is that we, in liberal arts, we, we adopt these grand theories and then the grand theories explain any kind of nuance in the world. So we don't become intelligent and carefully thinking people that contextualize theory to outcome. We become audiogogs that say that our grand theory is better than your grand theory. And that's the, pro that's the problem that we have. Right. So when I read people like the reason I like Darity's work so much, is because he's given us an explanation of how we could actually solve a wealth disparity, not an income disparity, but a wealth disparity that he's recognized between households. Right. So I think that when you're looking at, you know, stratification economics or looking at any other form of um, political economy or racism, that these are the kinds of nuanced theories that we need to talk about. When you're looking at racism, why does racism seem to affect black men so much so got in so much, many worse ways than their female counterpart. That's just not like a, oops, we just noticed. That's a, well, what's the mechanism and processes that are driving that, right? So the people I'm reading are kind of pushing that envelope. You know, people like Calvin Warren, he he does, he he's uh, having a conversation with Afro-pessimism. He's talking about political nihilism. He's, he's interested in what are the contours and limitations of ontology in our actual categories of existence. These are important debates to have. They're not just being ideologically committed to one position because it sounds cooler because it's popular. We require thinkers in the world. We need black thinkers, not people who repeat or parrot black thought. There's already a Wilderson. and there's already a Kimberly Crenshaw. What else do you have to offer the world? And what I think we do now is we've incentivized these grand theories to such an extent that we're not so interested in the new kinds of thought, the new kinds of the debates, the, the criticisms now, because if you criticize a theory, it somehow means you're a bad person and shouldn't be employed. And that's a problem. 
Because whereas white people are having debates with each other, be they liberal or conservative, they're materialist, anti-materialist, realist, anti-realist, they're debating each other. So what the debates do is it creates a new kind of culture. It creates the kinds of tensions and antagonisms that generate new thoughts and new ways that people can figure out problems. Black scholars are around saying, if you don't believe X, if you don't agree with this identity, there's nothing else that could be solved. There's nothing else that could be talked about. If you don't do this, you're on the wrong side of track. You shouldn't be in these departments. Most of these departments that are doing black studies that are doing black philosophy, et cetera, have, agree about the intellectual position they're taking. So while that creates a kind of uniformity in what you're doing, it certainly doesn't create the rich intellectual exchange around the ideas. And when there is disagreement, Marxism versus Afro-pessimism, optimism versus paraontology, those debates aren't antagonistic. They're not going at each other trying to figure out what's the answer of the truth because we allied empiricism. So so we, we have a problem with the way that we've dealt with dialectical or antagonistic thinking or thought. So whereas other groups are still fighting each other and trying to commit themselves to finding the evidence or the theories that prove something, we've become very, very comfortable with taking the majoritarian consensus on certain kinds of problems. And I think that's extremely dangerous. I, all well said, I, and I think that is a, a, great, a great way to conclude the webinar. Um, Dr. Curry, I just want to thank you so much for your time and for your powerful you. talk. And I appreciate folks that uh, attended the webinar. And let's keep struggling. All right. Take care, everybody. <laughs>